Welcome back to another episode of Top Shelf Creator. Today, we talked with Terry Weaver. Terry is a business coach and idea strategist who specializes in helping remarkable leaders navigate the galaxy of entrepreneurship. His biggest goal is to help you discover what you really want and help discover the map to head in the direction and arrive at the destination that you desire. In today's episode, we talked about where technology has been, where it's heading, as well as how to build a business and a life that you actually want to live in a way that is sustainable for you. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Cabrina Budwell, and you're about to experience the best way to create a thriving creator business online from other creators just like you, who are making a full-time living doing what they love. We are here to help you create a sustainable business that helps you more than survive, but thrive. Get ready. Because this is the first creator podcast to give you clarity, strategy, and tactical solutions to position yourself in the market, create systems that convert, and harness your influence to scale your community. Welcome to the Top Shelf Creator Podcast. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of Top Shelf Creator. I'm here with my good friend and personal coach, Terry Weaver. And Terry, thank you for coming on the show. And I'd love for you to talk about your interest in creators and the creator economy and a little bit of your opinion on how we got here. Oh, you want my opinion today, huh? Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's fun. Uh, how did we get here? Well, you, we got here because you said yes to come to the thing. Uh, our, my friend and former Disney Imagineer McNair Wilson posted that he was headed to Orlando and you're like, I want to go to Orlando. I know McNair. I want to go play at Disney World for a couple of days. And so you came to my conference, um, The Thing, which we're coming up on again this year. And of course, you're coming back and you're actually going to be on a panel this year. But, uh, you know, why am I interested in creative? That's interesting. That's an interesting question because, you know, even defining what a creator or what a creative is is a, is a weird subject for me because anyone that's making anything is a creator or a creative that we've all we've all been put here with the purpose, a purpose to make things. And to make the world better, and so I'm, you know, I consider myself, you know, I'm not an artist, but I've always worked with artists, whether they're musical or fine artists. Um, but I definitely consider myself a creator. I mean, I'm always creating content uh, online, writing, speaking. Um, I think coaching is very much an art form. Um, you know, I, I think what a creative person ultimately does is they try to get the best out of whatever the medium they're working with. You know, for coaching, it's a person. For, um, you know, for an art, a fine artist, it's a canvas or a piece of clay. For a musician, it's a, it's an instrument. And so, you know, anyone that's making making anything wants to bring the best out of that. Um, I recently had an experience here in Nashville where we went to um, Sean Brock's new restaurant. And Sean Brock is a, has a show on uh, called Chef's Table that he was featured on on Netflix. Um, and learning how someone can make very, very simple ingredients sing is very much what a creator or a creative does. And so, um, in fact, their cocktail menu is just a basket of fruit and vegetables. And you just point at whatever fruit you want, and that's what they make you a cocktail with. So, you know, and I think, I think any creative is someone who looks at whatever the work they're doing and says, man, how can I make this the best it possibly can be? How can I make this person or this piece of art remarkable? Yeah. So I think it goes nicely with a study that I was just reading about from Adobe, where they were saying that one in four people in the world consider themselves or are some sort of creator. And I found that interesting because I've always gone with the idea that all of us are creators in some way or another, but they had a definition of anyone over the age of 18, which I found interesting. And they had to be creating some kind of content and then publishing things to come back to that on social media to build almost like a personal brand. So it's now that we're in this weird space where we're defining what is a creator, we're trying to do it from like a study standpoint of like how many creators are there and who are they and what do they do and how do they function? See, I think that's part of being a creator is that you don't let anybody else define you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting they put an age limit on it. In fact, you know, the person that makes the most revenue the last time I checked on YouTube is a kid that opens to unwraps toys. Mm-hmm. Ryan. Toys. So to say that that kid is not a creator is absurd. Um, 
in, in fact, I, I think the world, um, I think the world works really hard to make us non-creative. I think mm-hmm. we're all born, um, you know, you're well aware of the project that, 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 that we do with our friend McNair, the Toy Box Project. And, you know, one of the concepts that we, when you and I, you and I go into corporations and teach is, is that we talk about the idea of, of how we were all born. We were all born creative. We were all, um, one of my mentors told me that we were, we're all born Play-Doh, but we die Lego. You know, we're born soft and pliable and eventually life happens. Um, circumstances happen. People talk us and tell us that we can't be or do things. And then we eventually become, um, hard and rigid and unmovable and so you know um, I don't I don't I hate to argue with a big organization like Adobe but there's a lot of things I don't like about Adobe so I'm not I'm not scared to <laughs> yeah well and I think that it's interesting that a platform like that that services creators is trying to put them in a box because we don't understand even the creator economy fully yet we're still barely dipping our toe into what does all this mean with web three and NFTs and all these different decentralization pieces that are big staples, not the necessarily the main things, but big staples within the creator economy. And we've already seen web three kind of hit its first kind of speed bump. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the same thing has happened at every iteration of the internet. It's interesting you bring that up because how many times in marketing and in business are are we told that something is dead you know everything is dead email's dead you know facebook is dead you know non ad driven content is dead everything is dead and the only things that die are the things that don't serve us any longer you know there there are there are still people out there um using old school marketing techniques that worked in the fifties. They're just using it to a very specific group. And so, you know, we keep trying to say that everything is dead and that this doesn't work anymore. And that, Oh, NFTs are over. They'll never work anymore. And, and I, and I, and I by no means claim to understand NFTs, but what's most interesting to me about NFTs and web three is the platform that it allows community to exist on. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone who I know that's crazy in NFT, most of them aren't talking about the money they're making. They're talking about the community and the relationships that are built. And I think community is the key loss kind of secret. You know, if Indiana Jones is running in a cave looking for it, community is what every creator should be looking to be a part of. And create. Yes. Well, and we're starting to see people, instead of calling it the creator economy, people are slowly starting to drip in community economy, which I find really interesting because of the ideas behind how NFTs and how, honestly, how creators function, because we tend to come together. There's very few of us that just kind of create in silence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think I, I, I've not heard the community economy, but I love it. And I think that's, that's not a new thing though. We, we, we try to act like all these things that are coming around they're just different iterations of you know you know it's fashion i mean this is like the third time in my lifetime birkenstocks have been cool (laughs) right like and i always have a rule like if i wore it the first time around i'm not wearing them again unless it's something i really love like um and so it's super it's super interesting of of why so much part of like our culture is that we have to try to define things that may not that may not necessarily fit that may not have a definition that may not um, may not necessarily fit someone else's mold. I, I know, you know, as your coach, I know that, you know, you and other people and, you know, we're always struggling with the labels that we put on ourselves and the labels that, that people, others put on us. And um, one of your other mentors and someone who I think is a cool dude is, you know, James Wedmore, who kind of shifted things for me when he said, you know, that you don't need a niche, your products need a niche. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a game changer for me because I, I, I had, I had gotten drowned out of the voices of every guru telling me that I wasn't niched down enough. And I'm like, well, well no, I, I don't, I don't fit in your box. Um, my whole life has been trying to exist outside of a box. Um, 
And so I think that's one of the things that creators really struggle with um, is this idea of trying to fit into a box and a, con and a construct that somebody else is trying to shove them in that they may not fit in. Yeah, well, and that brings us to something that you asked me in our mastermind a couple of months ago of like, if you were going to put yourself in a box, what would that look like? And me and another member of the mastermind sat down and just kind of like talked through like, what does that look like? Because we need to be able to talk about ourselves in a succinct way that people understand. Because as creators, we tend to be so all over the place. We're like, we're good at these things. And we, once we talk to people and we explain it, then people are like, oh my gosh, okay, I get it. But in small amounts, you need to be able to have something you can hand over to somebody. And being able to, what you were just saying, have a niche for your offer and your product, but not have to feel like you've put yourself in a box in a way to where I can only do these couple of things because this is what I'm doing and then lose the passion of where, what, why you started in the first place. Well, and I think a, an awkward number of us are, you know, ADD, a lot of my friends, especially my really, really high performing friends, a lot of them are somewhere on the spectrum. years ago they would have been called they would have, they would have been diagnosed with Asperger's um, but a lot of high level a significant number of the millionaires I know are ADHD and the interesting thing about those kind of a lot of people would say that those are you know a disability but you know the interesting thing that I've learned is those people have learned to use those those op, those quirks or those differences as a superpower not like a, a, a sentence or a diagnosis of a disease and so um, for me trying to do just one thing only and always would 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 literally be a death sentence for me i would i i, I could i would probably not get out of bed if i knew that every day had to look the same yeah well and i think that's the fun of it yeah. we get to do something different all the time I mean, I, I tell people all the time that I'm genuinely unemployed. Um, I am I am past the point in life. I have not had an actual real job in over 20 years. Um, you know, I've gotten paid for things. I you know I do a lot of 1099 activities, um, but I've not gotten up. I, I've not used an alarm clock in over 20 years, um, and that's because I know I tend to work until like. I'm done, and I get up when I need to get up. Now, if I have a reason to get up, obviously I use an alarm clock. If I'm near the airport, or if I have responsibilities, or I'm meeting, you know, and, um, a few, a few, a few of the thing gang were here a few weeks ago, and we were working on projects together, and so you know, I made sure to get up at a decent hour then. But you know, I, I, I try to not live a whole lot of my life inside the bounds that other people have designed for me, and. You know, I think that's what a true creator does is they're really look they're really looking to exist outside of the normal norms of society. They exist outside of that. Um, you know, one of the things that Gary Vanderchuk has been talking about that I've really enjoyed his conversation around is there's a lot of buzz in the you know online coaching world and the, the marketing world and in the you know the career coaching world about you know quiet quitting. And uh, the great resignation. And he's like, you know, y'all are mad about that. You're about to be really mad because this next generation isn't going to apply for anything. Mm -hmm. This next generation coming out of high school now realizes that they can make $65,000 a year making a small amount of content that they love around a, around a brand or a product or an idea or a game and make a modest living not doing a whole lot that actually looks like work. So that why would they bother working for you to be underpaid and overworked and over? And underappreciated and you know the average the average person gets hired at a job they, they get minimal raises um you know my wife has one of those real jobs and it's like they you know they'll just send it up you know you guys are getting a two percent raise mm -hmm. i'm confident because i know i know my wife she's gotten more than two percent better in the last year she's gotten more than two percent more efficient and quicker and more effective and then faster at solving problems. And so, you know, the creator economy rewards you for those things where typical employment really doesn't. 
And so I think that's why you're going to see even more and more people, you know, much like you and I are doing here on a podcast. You know, the, the best thing about a podcast is anyone can start a podcast. Mm -hmm. The worst thing about a podcast is anyone can start a podcast. And so be, be, and, and, and every field is becoming that, you know, the best thing about being, you know, I hate that. I hate the term influencer because I think anyone um, that has an audience of any kind, it's an influencer, whether it's being a mom, and that's the only focus in your life that you do is influencing your kid. You're definitely an influencer. You're literally changing the next generation of humanity. And so, uh, but other people, you know, you don't have to go and make branded content on Instagram on the beach somewhere to be an influencer. Um, in fact, a lot of those people don't actually have any real life influence. Mm -hmm. uh, because an influencer, by definition, is someone that's influencing someone to do something. You don't want to just be an online motivator. You want to be a mo an online activator that you're activating people to actually do something. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. It's interesting you bring that up because one of the other things that this Adobe study was saying is that most of the people within the creator economy are millennials. It was like 44, 43 percent. And that we've got a smaller amount of Gen Z at 14 percent. And so it's, I think that a lot of them. One of the things that we've talked about with other people on this the podcast is the idea that there's a lot of parents still pushing their kids towards traditional education, traditional jobs, like the whole idea of you can be anything as long as you are a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, a firefighter, anything that we're that's known. And we're just starting to like get on the cusp of the younger generation of parents going, it's okay if you don't go to college. Because I did that too, and it didn't work. It's okay if you don't traditionally do X, Y, and Z because it didn't work out for me. So let's try something different. And I think that that mindset shift is what's changing the creator economy and why we see so many millennials because, you know, Gen Z is still young enough to where they're still trying to figure out their footing. Yeah. And the reason why people went to college was that there was a return on that you knew that if you went and got a degree that this was going to happen and these opportunities were going to come about. The problem is, is especially, um, you know, non-state schools and a lot of private schools, you know, people were going and getting a degree and, you know, cave diving and, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, biomedical, not even, you know, not, nothing that, that was tied to a field. You know, up in the biomedical, that's obviously some research, but, I'm trying to think of an example, you know, it's like, yeah, I got a minor in chess. Like, mm -hmm. what? You know, and, you know, there's a lot of people who did that stuff because their parents sent them to college. And, you know, you know, my generation, I'm part of the generation that no one talks about. And we're just the generation that's quietly being awesome. And that's Gen X. <laughs> and so we're just out here, like, living our life, ready to all move to an island and ignore the rest of you <laughs> um, and forget the madness because we're just, you know, we we're kind of the generation that didn't get our feelings hurt. We're the generation that just said we're gonna do. We were the first ones that started kicking the tires of all of this. You know, we grew up, and many of us came of age during the '90s. You know, you know when you when you were when you were you know coming through elementary school, many of us were were rolling into college and rolling out of high school and going. You know, we were getting on the internet when it was a dial up. You know, and we started to we we jumped into the very we were kind of the first ones in the water of this. Um, we're watching, you know, we're just coming off of the death of the queen. And if you want to look at like, she, you know, she just, she died at the age of 96. She's at the age of, I think, 25. So, you know, 70 years she reigned as queen over the Commonwealth. And the amount of progress that you saw in the life of the queen is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. You want to talk, if you want to take someone and look at a lifetime, Look at how much culture has changed in her 70 years. I mean, black and white television was where her coronation was seen. You know, when she passed away, she was the largest streamed, you know, media event of all time. And you want to talk about how much change occurred between, like, the little box of a television and bunny ears to people watching on their phones. Um, you know, tons of presidents. The, the dawn of, uh, you know, radio, you know, becoming, shifting and becoming radio shifting to television and television shifting to cable. 
you know, and cable shifting to, you know, other means like where, where we're at now. And who knows where it's going now? Now, you know, cable has shifted to streaming services and who knows what's happening next, right? What, whatever happens in Web3. And so in a very short period of time, I mean, 70 years in the course of how long humanity's been around um, isn't that long of a period of time. And we've seen a lot of advances in that 70 years. Um, yeah. And so, you know, one of those things that's advanced is education. You know, there's very little information that your generation or my generation now can't either Google or get on YouTube and figure out. Somebody had a book. I don't remember who it was. One of the gurus had a book that was everything is figure outable. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's Mar- I think it's Marie Forleo. You know, Marie Forleo. Yeah, that sounds right. And, um, you know, I mean, it's so true. I mean, there never has been a time in history. You know, you're in Colorado. I'm in Nashville doing a podcast this afternoon at, you know, the same resolution that the Queen's funeral was streamed. Mm-hmm. You know, we're both on 4K video recording, you know, high level audio talking to each other and you know that's an opportunity that that changes what we need to know um, the even just the advancements of an of a brand new iPhone coming out this week of how much that changes um, it's insane I mean what is what is the new I has a 48 megapixel camera and a Crazy. cinematic film camera I mean I've been watching some of the videos of people who have been comparing it to their like fifty thousand dollar red rigs, and it's you know it's not quite the same, but it's getting awful close. It's making it where the average person won't be able to tell the difference, which is crazy to think mm-hmm. about. That we all have access to being able to. I mean, I didn't even get on my laptop until after lunch today, because I was able to do everything else I needed to do on my phone. Mm-hmm. And the only well, reason I got my laptop out was because I was doing some web development, you know, about yeah. getting about to relaunch my website. So I was working on the web forms that would just make me pull my hair out on my phone. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's one of those things that, that the, the technology is moving so fast, the opportunity is moving so fast that some things haven't evolved. And education is one of those. And a lot of a lot of the, not just education, but parents' expectations around expectations around um, education you know when you're when your kids get to that age of like it's time to make a decision to go to college or not i don't i don't foresee college being remotely relevant unless your kids Mm -hmm. want to be doctors lawyers or astronauts absolutely well and even with them we've talked about the idea behind okay my oldest wants to be an inventor So anytime that we're talking about things, like she's finding ways to make things happen and she's eight. So them not having a business before they even are 18 is just not even a thing that's been feasible in our minds of they're going to have something that they're doing themselves. But all the technology thing brings up some good ideas of there isn't a whole lot of barrier to entry anymore. The biggest barrier to entry is actually the kinds of content you can create. It comes down to the ideas and how you're actually cultivating those. And I think that that's where a lot of the things that we tend to talk about a lot, like community and being involved in things like masterminds and going to conferences and having friends within the same space is so important because talking to friends of mine who don't have businesses, they're like, they think differently and they're not exactly sure that their opinion matters and that they're just stuck in this thing instead of looking at it like, oh my gosh, this is choose your own adventure and you can get out of these things anytime that you want. I think the biggest barrier is nothing but belief. I think it's belief in yourself. I think it's being around other people who believe, people who see greatness within you and people who refuse to let you settle for less than you can. And you're right. If you're hanging out with a bunch of people that have jobs that they sit around and complain about every weekend, that's probably the path that you're going to stay on. But if you're around people who are doing, you know, when you start getting in rooms where where, where everyone in that room is make, is doing what you want to be, you know, they're taking action and stepping in and leaning to what you want to be and who you want to become, your life starts to change. And, you know, I, we all go through things and have circumstances where our belief in ourselves becomes reduced. 
our belief in our own personal capacity um, becomes where we don't believe it's possible for us. And so, you know, I see that with my coaching clients all the time when when life hits hard and life is going to hit, like things are going to happen. Things are going to happen at home. Things are going to happen around you to those you love um, and to those who don't love you. Um, and you have to choose and bet on yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to pick yourself. And, um, you know, the the safe bet may, may, may be the wrong one. And that's why college has worked is because it's been the safe bet. Mm -hmm. But actually, I see, I, I think it's quickly becoming the biggest gamble. Um, you know, we, we, my wife and I, we don't have kids. We have two dogs. And so, but if we did have kids and we were sitting down and having the conversation around college right now, I would say, I have saved for you to go to college, but I don't want you to go to college unless that's what you really want. Can I invest in you? Can we take that money and invest in you doing something you love, whether that's getting a mentor you know, say, let's, let's talk to creators. this way. Say you wanted to be a filmmaker. You know, I would call up someone who I knew that made movies and I would say, hey, go hang out with him. If you wanted to be a photographer, I would say, go hang out with, um, you know, David Molnar or Jeremy Coward or one of these people that I know that is an awesome photographer. If you, um, if you wanted to be a podcaster, I'd say, go hang out with these people and learn how to do it. If, whatever the thing is that you want to do, get yourself in proximity to those people as, and I, I think you're right. I think by the time your kids are teenagers, that, that the reality of them starting businesses and, um, you know, I remember growing up and I would invent things all the time, but everybody, everybody talked me out of it, right? Like there was mm -hmm. never like, there was never a way, the barrier of entry existed. Like there was no way to get that to our kid. I mean, you and I could have an idea right now, have it on, on sale, either on Etsy or even Amazon tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have things like Kickstarter, where even if it's a bigger idea, you can get that kind of backing that didn't exist even 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Kickstarter has kind of become one of those things where people are, you know, the, the, the waters are a little muddy there because, mm -hmm. you know, but you're right. I mean, crowdfunding and uh, pre-sales and, you know, there's so many. They're just, we have this, most creators have the same access as Fortune 500 companies. What they don't have often is the, the um, experience and the budget. Yes. And that's where coaching comes in. And that's where. Um, a lot of things really don't require, I mean, if you wanted to make a movie 10 years ago, you needed to go, um, you needed to have a film crew, you needed to do it. And most everything you need, you need to do to make a movie, you could do it. And you could have it up on YouTube almost immediately. I know someone that shot a comedy special, got that Joker on YouTube. And because no one would, no one would, no one would, would pick them. They picked themselves. They got millions of views and then they booked a massive tour to back it up. And we're seeing that on TikTok right now with artists. Yep. And that's you have to blow up your song market. there. It's happening in every, um, I mean, I see your Spotify playlist. So I know what your list, I can see the song you're listening to because I can pull up what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. And half the time it's someone that I know that you found on TikTok. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the group you love? The, AJR and AJR. Charlie Puth. Charlie Puth actually is just about to release his album that he's been making on TikTok. So he'll come up with a random idea or he'll hear a sound and he's been slowly putting these together and seeing which ones hit off. And now he's finally got his 12 tracks that he's going to be releasing. And I, I found it fascinating to be like, okay, well, you know, he took like one of my favorites right now is called light switch. It literally, he took a light switch and was like, this would make a cool sound and then just put things around it until it finally was a song. Mm -hmm. And so he's giving you an example of how to create while still creating. And that's interesting mm -hmm. because you have other creators. Um, I actually like Chelsea Cutler, but she's really kicked back against um, the idea of like having to make songs for TikTok, And she doesn't, you know, and that's, that happens in every time 
culture shifts if somebody digs their heels in, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody says, ah, daggone it. I like the way it used to be. Uh, back in my day, you know, we didn't have to make songs for so. And, and you can either, you know, I worked in the music business for years and I saw lots of um, Goatee Records, which is a label here in Nashville owned by Toby Mac, did digital downloads before iTunes existed. And when they were purchased by a company called EMI, which is one of the largest companies in the world, the first thing they did was shut down their digital content. And then a couple of years later, iTunes came out. And had they not done that, had they embraced that, they might have been the lead mm -hmm. on that. And we've seen that every time culture shifts. Um, people either embrace it or figure out how to work with it, or they sit around and complain They complain about it. Yeah. A couple of years ago, 15 years ago, it was Napster. Ah, oh, those kids and their downloads. Or, you know, artists like Limp Bizkit literally just embraced them and started literally putting their own content up there and said, all right, well, if this is where the ball field is, we're going to go play ball. And, you know, um, you know, I, I, I resisted creating content on TikTok for a long time because I thought, because I, all the gurus were like, you need to point at words and you need to dance. And I'm like, that's mm -hmm. not who I am. I'm going to show up as me. And so I've just been showing up as me. And now, granted, am I making a million dollars a month on TikTok? No. Will I be releasing a course on how to create content on TikTok? No. But I'm able to play in the space and still be unique to and genuine to who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, you know, Charlie Puth, you're right. That's a great example of like, okay, you know, nobody really wants their song to be reduced to a 30 second sound. Break. You know, that's a, a lot of the, we get so tied to content. It's interesting that we're talking about this because this conversation came up all the time when I manage musicians. You know, when you're a creator, when you're making something, it's yours when you make it. But as soon as someone else that experiences it, it becomes theirs too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're seeing that even on TikTok with the duets. You know, someone else is basically experiencing getting on and, and believe me i don't understand duets i don't get i don't i don't get it you're not going to see me sitting there nodding to that's not who i am and that's not what I, but i understand I, I understand enough about it to know that it's not necessarily a good fit for me and my content um i have seen a couple people do it with my content and it's super awkward uh to watch it but you also know that like you also know that it's as a creator, I know that somebody else is, oh, okay, they got it too. Mm -hmm. And that's really the goal is whatever we make, we want somebody else. We should be creating things that allow other people into the conversation. And most of us aren't interested in conversations. Most of us are just interested in monologues. Um, and that's what a community creates is communities create conversations. And so I would encourage anyone listening today that's thinking about, you know, their content, asking themselves, hey, what can you do to create conversations with the audience, with your community? And, you know, what can, what can the content that you can, that you make can help other people start conversations? Yeah. Well, and I think that's the beauty of duets in my opinion is that you get to almost be as if you're in the room with that person. Yeah. If you were sitting at a conference, because that's what you would be doing. You would be sitting there nodding. And it gives people the opportunity when they take it to put in their own little pieces, words, or stitching it to where they can give you one piece of the, that content and then give their opinion on it. And so TikTok has changed the way that we interact with each other because you can interact with big creators, even if you're not directly talking to them, as well as people that are rising. And I think that's the beauty of it is that's why I find so many of the people that come on this podcast from TikTok. Because I'm watching people rise and I'm like, this is awesome to watch you. Let's do it together and let's get your message out in front of more people. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, 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 you've been around me enough to know that I say a jillion times, you know, a rising tide rides the lost ships. And part of the creator economy in order for it to continue to be successful is everyone's going to kind of have to put down their agenda and say, how can I help everyone around me succeed? Now, I know that I know I'm a little different. I know I'm weird. I think differently. Um, that's what makes me me. But I, I firmly believe that, you know, I want to create an environment where everyone around me rises. And I want to, I actually want to create an environment 
where it's uncomfortable not to lose. Where it's uncomfortable to stay the same. And I believe I believe I I'm doing that. I'm actually watching it happen. I'm watching people self select out of my community who are uncomfortable because they've not changed. You know, I've talked to a few people that aren't coming to my event this year because they've not done anything with the information they got at the last one. And, you know, that's tough. I hate that for them. But I'm not going to stay at the shore, tethered to the dock, so you can stay put. Uh, I have another group of people that are ready to go hit the, the, the great big blue, as they would say in uh, Finding Nemo, you know. And, and so, you know, if you want to rise, let's go. Let's, let's do it. Um, but don't, don't accept... Don't accept yourself staying around people who aren't rising. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting to always see it because it's like having this old friend come back into my life who I knew in junior high and high school and 10 years later talking about where I'm at and what I'm doing. And all of a sudden there's lists of things that he's wanted to do for years, but never felt that he could. And being around people that have bigger vision and bigger ideas made it easier for him to see that that was a possibility. But I think that it goes back to what kind of people are you hanging out with and what are you talking about on the weekends and what's the bigger thing? Because if you're the only person with the vision, it's a lot more difficult to get it out into the world because you don't have that support. Not impossible, but it's just a little bit more difficult because you have to remind yourself constantly. And sometimes you need that person who can just be like, hey, you've got this. Here's all the good things that you're missing while you're stuck in the minutiae of building this. And I think one of the barometers that you can ask yourself is when you're gathering around your friends and your people, are you talking about other people? Or are you talking about ideas? Are you talking about gossip? Or are you talking about what you can do um, together to move things forward? Now, sure, there's always going to be like a moment where we need to vent about people in our lives that are like not, Mm -hmm. that are keeping us from where we want to be. I mean, that happens all the time. That definitely happens in my world. Um, but normally it's like, all right, well, that pity party is over. Next. And how can we, how can we, um, how can we move forward together? Well, in deciding if it's a, if you're solving a problem or if you're just ruminating in the yes, problem. Wallowing. And I think that it's one of those things that you can go between the two because I, as humans, we're just going to, there's going to be moments where we're going to wallow. And it's going to be hard to pull ourselves out of it. But that's why you have those people who are like, you're built for more than this. You have potential. Here's the things that I'm seeing that you just can't see because of this moment that you're in. You know, and I think, I think great friendships and great coaching relationships are mirrors. They're people that can mm-hmm. hold up something to us and say, you know, we, al- we always talk about that, that scene in Peter Pan. The Rob Williams Peter Pan, when uh, the lost boy puts his hand on his face and says, "Oh, there you are, Peter," and I love that scene. It's one of my favorite scenes in all in all of in all of film because it's that moment where where he had left and gone to the rat race of the world and came back and like found himself again and discovered who he really was. Um, and so I, I, I think. I think it's super important to have people that are willing to, you know, say, oh, there, there you are. That's who you are. That's what you were designed to do. That's what you told me you wanted to do. How can I help mm-hmm. you do that? Yeah, it's that balance between becoming who you know that you are born to be and unbecoming the person that the stigmas in the world has put on to us, yeah. like college, like, you know, you're set to do this one thing or this is not how things are supposed to be. And saying, how do I actually want this to be? Yeah, and how do you, how do you, what what do you, you know, you've heard me ask this before. It's my favorite question to ask people. Tell me what you want and what you really, really want. And once you know what you really want out of life, someone can help you actually go get it. But until you really allow yourself to lean into discovering, like, this is who I am. This is what I was born to do. This is what I really want. Once and once you decide that, it's really hard to stop stop someone that's got that determined heart and that determined mind 
um, that they're going to go steadfastly after the mission at hand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a lot of people, you know, that are, they call themselves creators. They're, they're wanting, they're wanting time freedom. That's what's more valuable to them most of the time than money. They're wanting the ability to um, have locate potentially location freedom, the ability to, 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 to get to work when, where, and how they choose and they, they desire. Um, and so, you know, ne never before, never before the pandemic even has shifted that for corporate America where companies are having to start to decide, um, especially in the creative industries, if they're going to hire people based on, you're going to have a hard time if you really want someone to be in your office. I mean, even companies like Apple and Google are having really, really, really struggling with keeping the best talent in the building. Um, just because people want, people want the ability to live around what they love and what brings the best out in them. And I think, I think where we live and the people that we're around physically definitely has an effect on who we become. And, you know, and if you're in a situation where you find yourself stuck, um, I would challenge you to look at the people around you and see if the reason why you're stuck is the people that are in your circumference. Yeah. Well, and, you know, finding those places and experimenting with what, what places light me up, what people light me up. Where do I get all of the good ideas? And finding ways to be in those spaces more and be able to feed off of that energy. Absolutely. And I think if it doesn't exist where you are, you either need to go somewhere else or create it where you are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, even like locally, I'm getting super intentional about how I can create it. Because um, you guys all come here and visit and go, you know, almost every time someone comes and stays at my house or comes in, in town for a VIP coaching day or they end up like starting to look at real estate <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's, and it's because, you know, Nashville is a different kind of place for that because it's one of those cities. Um, there's a few cities in America. I think Austin is one of those cities. Nashville is one of those cities. Um, New York and LA, I think were those cities. I think they're struggling to be those cities. Um, just because of politics and um, some weirdness in those places that are kind of keeping it um, from happening, but I think you're seeing these cities that where there's a where where the norm around you is a culture of creativity and a culture of um, of resistance, not like the resistance um, in Pressfield's War of Art, but the resistance to accepting the status quo. You know, mm -hmm. where, where, where everyone there has kind of said that I'm going to, I'm going to play, I'm going to play, I'm going to set my own board game rules. You, know, you and I have talked a lot about board games and how games yeah. kind of help us. And, you know, you can only win the game that you know that you're playing. And when you start to set the rules for the game, everything changes. When you start to um, dictate how the game is going to be played and who you're playing it with, um, everything changes. And most of us show up trying to play by our rules on somebody else's game and that doesn't work. And so um, if you don't have that kind of space in that environment where you live, um, try to create it. I mean, I know even myself, I've had a talk with a couple of really high level leaders and we're even being really specific about where we want to meet. And, you know, because for us, what we're, we've kind of said is like, wow, and this, someone may hear this and be totally offended at that. And that's okay. I, I don't mind offending people. Um, we've even said we want to meet at a certain kind of restaurant because we kind of want to make it unaffordable. We don't want people who aren't taking the, the investing in themselves seriously because um, typically what you, you, when you start to get around, the, when the budget shrinks, so does the mindset because most people who can afford an expensive restaurant have the are making are not making scarcity decisions and you know and not to say that i mean we all haven't been in that place but in the places that we're at right now i need to be strategic about the environments that i put myself in as a leader so that i am leveling up but that's not to say i mean I, I i put out a ton of things for free um i do a podcast 
like you, I create video content all the time. I'm in the middle of creating a free, couple of free courses right now. I am wanting to put out as much into the world as I possibly can. But I'm also knowing in order for me to be able to do, in order for me to actually be able to afford to do that, I've got to be around the people that are making me better and that are pushing me to a higher level. And, and I think that's where creators get stuck, though, is that you get some success and then you can't figure out how to get any more because we're not thinking about it like an actual business. And it we get into, stuck into that freelancer mindset yeah. of just going from one thing to the next to the next to the next because we enjoy what we're doing. We enjoy the freedom that it gives us to a certain extent, but then we don't know how to grow it so that we can actually impact more people and do the things that we really want to do. And because the longer you do it, the bigger the dream gets, the bigger the vision is. Yeah. And, you know, the more that it's going to take other people to make the dream real. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely at that phase right now where I, I have more ideas than I will ever be able to take it to in the rest of my life. That's the reason why you and I are working together on a couple projects. Because I know, I know if those ideas sat on the back burner for me, they would ne they would never get started. Now you and I will start to have problems when you when I start to share ideas with you and you don't do anything with them. Mm -hmm. Because I think the thing that really, I'm at a phase right now that I don't want people to orphan my ideas. Because I when the, when I create something, when I come up with something, I think of it a lot like a parent would think of a child. I've invested time, heart, and energy, um, and even things that don't require, you know, when you start to invest days and weeks of time and of conversation in projects, and other people don't s take the same seriousness to it, it gets really frustrating. And that's why I'm working really hard to, to do the things and to call the people around me. Um, I'm realizing as a creator that I'm responsible for my success and then no one ever is going to care about my success more than I do. You know, yeah. as, as I, as we talk about my, this event that I do the thing, you know, I, I put a lot of hopes of the success of it on other people, other people that I thought would help make it happen. And they just, to be really clear, they haven't. So I'm, I'm trying to raise up the people that have been in the seats of the audience and make them, better and help them succeed because if i can do that with them and i trust that i've found good humans to do that with and that they'll be loyal uh, because loyalty is one of my core values i think i think that's one of the problems in the creator economy right now is people aren't loyal they're only loyal to themselves and um you know that that has a short fuse <laughs> that that if we can build things where everyone is really genuinely caring about seeing other people succeed, and I'm seeing that in the mastermind that you're a part of, and you're a huge part of that, Cabrina, of pouring into other people and like making sure that other people are succeeding. Um, the people that are in this current mastermind, it's it's my elite level mastermind that Cabrina is a part of. Um, the things that are happening on our calls and the things that people are doing after the calls, I mean, it it. it feels like we're a, we're a, we're a part of something that we're going to be talking about in 10 or 20 years mm -hmm. because of the action that's getting taken and you know one of our one of our people's in Uganda this week um, helping rescuing kids that are getting trafficked over there um, one's in in New York doing things one's helping a nonprofit with a almost a six figure project you know you're launching this podcast other people are doing other things and we're seeing people take action and honestly, the people that haven't been taking action have kind of found their, 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 themselves in Sabrina. Yeah. And um, that sucks. It sucks to see people not stick with it and stay on it and, and even break their commitments. But what happens when you when you decide to lean into um, calling yourself to greatness is you kind of start to not accept anyone that's not going to do that around you. And so mm -hmm. man, I'm, I'm excited for this season that I'm in in life seeing the people around me rise and seeing the people around me do the, the work that they need to do to step into um, this next season of growth. Yeah. Well, and loyalty, I think bringing that up is something that is a problem within the creator economy is important to point out because if we're so, we're wanting to build community so badly, we're coming at it from a perspective of how do I grow more people? How do I get more following? How do I get more email subscribers so that I can make more money? Instead of these are the people that 
I've made the Kool-Aid and I need them to drink it because this is important to me beyond what I'm putting into my bank account. And that's what leads to the bigger wins. You know, it's funny. Right before you came into the community, my talk in um, in the middle of the pandemic was about the Kool-Aid man. And so if I have a set on the other side of my office and people are always like, what's the Kool-Aid man story again? And um, it, it, the Kool-Aid man normally makes an appearance at the thing. Um, we have a blow up suit that we put one of our people in. Uh, Ian. Um, Cause he's <laughs> that guy. And uh, we literally at, at the thing 2020, which was the thing that we did in the house. I literally gave everybody Kool-Aid and I'm like, this is Kool-Aid you can drink. Because you guys have all gotten here in the middle of, we all, we all got in the house in the middle of the pandemic like crazy people because we were all just struggling and needed community. We needed to be around people who were still persevering. And most of us hadn't seen another human <laughs> for more than like a dinner in months. Mm -hmm. And um, we all we all did this thing and we, we talked about this. We did an online summit and I talked about the Kool-Aid man that I think successful creators and successful entrepreneurs are people that come to a wall and approach that like it's the Kool-Aid man does. But if the wall won't come down, he's just going to go through it. And, you know, and when he gets to the other side of that wall, what does he yell? <laughs> oh, yeah, because he's ready for a party, <laughs> right? Now, granted, you're probably a little young. You probably don't remember the Kool-Aid I've seen it a couple of times. And there's a lot of questions but... about the Kool-Aid man that you could ask. It's like, <laughs> so he's a glass bottle that goes through walls. People drink out of him. I don't understand all of this. Like. We could, mm -hmm. we, we could go, we could go Kool-Aid man conspiracy theories. But when you talk about Kool-Aid, you know, obviously there was a cult leader that literally killed everyone with Kool-Aid. And so I realized that there's a certain, like, you know, when you say drink the Kool-Aid, I'm like, oof, boy, that's uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. it's true. I need people around me that really believe in it enough. And there's a certain level of trust that when people, when, pe when you serve up something that people have to, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you're trusting that you're not going to get food poisoning. Yeah. Um, that's why I don't go to Chipotle anymore. <laughs> because I had one too many friends get food poisoning from Chipotle. And so, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's what happens in brands and business and other, in like personal brands, is you get poisoning from the stuff that people have served up. There's a lot of, on, you know, there's one online entrepreneur, we're not going to mention their name, but their whole deal is they always, we are always talking about it because they're like, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And it's like, oh, come on. No, no not that. Everybody can't do it. It's mm -hmm. going to be hard. And like the Kool-Aid man says, is you're going to get to the wall and you're going to have to make a decision. And I know you personally, you're in a season where like there's walls going up and you're having to make decisions literally every day. Am I going to stand here and stare at this wall or am I going to bust through and break through? And I'll be honest, there are a lot of people that get to the wall and break down. But the people that can break through and the people that choose to be unstoppable are the people that really succeed. The people who say, I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to pick myself. And I want to be around people who break through walls. I don't want to be around people who stand on the other side of the wall and complain about the wall not coming down. Yeah. And I think that's the important part of having those people because they've already gone on the other side of the wall. Yes. And that doesn't mean there won't be more walls. You know, I'm, you know, set six weeks out for a conference and I'm seeing walls that have got to be broken through again. That's what it's part of leadership is. That's what leadership is every day. It's about making decisions about what you're going to do when the walls go down. Are you going to break mm -hmm. through them? Or are you going to stand by and watch the barriers keep you from what you want? Yeah. Well, in signing up to be an entrepreneur, our job title is literally professional problem solvers. Yep. And so if that's what our job is, then there's going to be problems. All of the which... people that you talk about as a leader, go, oh, I wish I could be like so-and-so. The number one characteristic that they have normally isn't invention. It's normally disruption. Mm -hmm. you know, Steve Jobs, he did not invent music. He did not invent a walk, the Walkman. He invented just a better version of it. Elon Musk is not Henry Ford. He didn't invent the car. He just made it better. He made it work. Um, and what's interesting about when you talk about Apple, Tesla, you know, they're both companies that have created some of the most innovative products in the world, but don't stop there. Now, you could argue about, you know, it, there's, there's the, the people are always saying about the iPhone. It's like it only gets marginally better every year. Well, you know what? That's better than most people. Mm -hmm. That's better than most people who just stay the same and accept the same all the time. Um, and so 
you know, I think you think you have to decide that you're going to disrupt. You know, and when things get disrupted, things get disheveled, things get out of out of place, things get um, your desk gets messy. Sabrina can can confirm that my desk is messy. Um, it's still just as clean as it was the last time she was here because she stood there and watched me clean it. We were having a brainstorming <laughs> meeting, and so like for me, when I'm when I'm creating, I like to be like I need a change of scenery a lot. And when we were in the where we were in the middle of working on this project, and it, it required. 112 and a half percent of my brain. It didn't require just a lot of the work that I do is like I'm using, you know, 50, 60 percent of capacity. But I'm some of the things that I choose to do are, are outside of the realm of my abilities, which requires me to push harder. And those things normally require extra, an extra cup of coffee and a change of scenery and a different whiteboard and a, and a different way to c- come at it. And so, yeah, it's a. Uh, the work is hard, and you, if you're thinking that being a creator is easy, and that that's what, if that's someone's justifications for kind of d- diving into this creator economy, man, get out of the water quickly, um, because it is not easy. It's a blast, but it is definitely not easy. Um, and mm-hmm. There will be new challenges. There's 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 technology changes every day, and you know, there are two things that always work. Have always have always and will always work. That number one thing is bring more value than the other people in the room and create good stuff. If you're the one bringing a ton of value, and I'm not talking about like, I'm talking about fifty one forty nine percent. I'm not talking about two hundred to five percent. I'm not talking about being taken advantage of, but I'm talking about being the one that's okay. Always being the one that brings more value than everybody else, and be okay, be okay with creating great content. Because great content always wins, um, and help, helping helping people always wins. The person who always, you know, guys like Zig Ziglar that have been dead for decades. You still have not been to a conference, and you know, a lot that I can remember when someone has it quoted, and they normally quote this: "You know, if you want to, if you want to make more money, help more people." Um, he has about fifteen quotes that are all kind of in that same. You want you want you want to get you want to. You want to get what you want, help people get what they want. You know? And mm-hmm. those things are timeless. They've been around for centuries. And so if you want to, if you want to get the things you want, find someone who's a creator in your world and reach out and help them. You know, I, I love Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. In fact, there's behind my desk. I have a few of my like, heroes. I have Walt Disney, um, Dr. Seuss, Jim Henson, and, and Fred Rogers that hang out back there um, behind me as little Funko Pops. And, they remind me, you know, Fred Rogers always says, you always want to find the helpers. You always want to find the people that are helping other people, the people that are doing. Um, and I've, I've been studying a lot lately because one of the, one of the book projects I'm working on is uh, one of my heroes died. And when they died, I kind of asked a question. It actually came up in my, my Facebook memories the other day. You know, who's going to be the next so-and-so? You know, who's going to be the next Walt Disney? Who's going to be the next Fred Rogers? And for the most part, nobody really had answers to those questions. Nobody, all these things that these, these, these creators that shaped our lives, there aren't a lot of people that are coming along to shape the future. And mm-hmm. I would encourage you to lean into that as a, as a leader. And if you're a creator, you're a leader. You're, chose, you're choosing to lead a conversation around something and lean into that, that you have the possibility that 20 years from now, someone's going to talk about, um, it's, it's like, you know, there's going to be a kid in a few years that's going to start a YouTube channel that's going to be the next un- unboxing kid. Or the next, um, you know, social media dance mom, or the next whatever that someone's going to come along and create something because of something that they saw someone else do. Yeah, well, and you know, we've seen little pieces of these creators, but nothing as big as what they've done. And I think that that's something that, as creators, now we can start looking at is how do we take those big ideas and those big visions and big dreams and actually create real change in the world for what we want versus just these tiny things, which I think felt folds into being with higher level people and always looking for that next thing and pushing yourself to that next level so that you have the resources in order to get to that point. You know, one of the things I did when I was researching, I was doing school assemblies and that's kind of how my book came about was doing school assemblies. And I went to the Walt Disney family museum 
which is located right by the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And the very next day or a day later, we ended up in wine country, because that's what you do when you go to San Francisco. You go to wine country before you leave, because you're right there. And we had just been at Pixar, which was an amazing, unforgettable. It was, it was, it was one of those bucket list trips um, where we were researching. And I spent the day with Pixar, talked to one of my friends there that was an animator, and got to kind of talk about how much how long it takes and just watching the process he was in the middle of animating um this scene for a monsters university like where they're running on top of the building that was what he was animating at the time so we got to see like a few clips of that he was allowed to show us kind of because it was actually in the trailer so he was allowed to show us scenes as he was working on it for the movie and um we ended up at the charles schultz schultz museum and charles schultz is who created the and it was interesting to watch the difference between the, the life of Walt Disney Dreams. Because when you go to the Walt Disney Family Museum, it's a couple of floors. But for the first, you kind of walk in to like his awards room and you see all these awards. And then you kind of go back in time and you go back to his childhood. And you go back to when he basically joined the, couldn't join the army. So he joined the medical troops and ended up at the end of World War II. And then you end up kind of walking through him coming back from the war, um, going bankrupt at the Laffogram. Um, because he lost Laugh Graham and going to Hollywood and you end up, you know, seeing the early days of Mickey Mouse. And the very next thing you see, after you kind of see, okay, the Walt, you know, Mickey Mouse and that happened, you see this room of the nine old men. And you begin, you know, you had just learned about Ub Iwerks and how Ub helped him create Mickey Mouse. And you see these nine old men that Walt created everything he created with a group of people. And then if you go to the Schultz Museum, you very rarely hear about anybody else in the museum except Mr. Schultz. Um, you just most of his life was at his desk. And you can actually go to that desk, and he sat at that desk every day alone and drew the peanuts. And the peanuts were brilliant. But for the most part, the peanuts have barely lived on. They're in some licensing, and they're on you know, Hallmark cards, and they've made a movie, and they've done one thing. But how many things of, of Walt Disney have been created after his life, after his death? Mm-hmm. You know, when Walt Disney died, you know, there's been hundreds of movies made. There's been um, theme parks in five countries, I think, now <laughs> made. And um, all after his death because he didn't create alone. And if you're a creator and you're doing it alone, at some point someone's going to go to a museum, maybe about you, and you're either going to make you're either going to make this decision now, if if you're going to be known for what you did together with other people, and that, that a legacy of creation will exist after you're gone, or you will be known that you just made stuff alone, and then you will be probably be forgotten. Mm-hmm. And you know, I want to be like Walt. I want to be a creator that's known for creating together. You know, you, you've heard me say a billion times that the African proverb, that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And the difference between Schultz and Disney is, you know, Schultz definitely went far, but he went alone. Uh, he, did not, he, did not, he did not go as far as he could have. He, he, his, his race ended a little early. Because those products have barely kind of crippled on through licensing, and um, he definitely didn't have the impact that he could have possibly made. Now, granted, he made a tremendous impact on Santa Rosa, California. You know, there's an ice skating rink in his honor. You know, it looks kind of like a strange bowling alley with ice. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's cool. That's a cool thing. It's not that he didn't have an impact, but his impact could have been much larger had mm-hmm. he created more things together and more more things with other people and so if you are and you're seeing that i mean you're seeing you know you're watching i've been you and i've talked a lot about Jax, who's one of my favorite tiktok creators mm-hmm. and how you know here's the story of a girl that was on american idol she was like the third place winner on american idol and she's kind of known for creating co-creating a lot of content and she just as she was blowing up but then just has this song called I Know Victoria's Secret that is literally like was number one on was hitting on Billboard and she's getting on the Today Show and um, she's kind of becoming a global sensation. She just flew this girl in on her on her TikTok channel to do a concert with her in L.A. Um, this girl from I think the girl was Dutch, you know, and it, it's crazy to watch how the power of our influence, if you let other people get involved in it, has the power. It be it. That story has become other people's story. She has mm-hmm. allowed something that she created 
to be the voice for other people because she has this whole song about positive body image and it's it's be, it's becoming much bigger than just what one person could have ever done it and so i invite every creator to see what they can do um, i invite my coaching i've I invited cabrina to that like hey what what can you do you know that's part of probably why we're having this conversation on this podcast right it's because you want to help people become you know this idea of becoming a top shelf creator not like the bottom shelf not like the the cheap stuff but to help to become like really high level creators that are making not just things, but making a difference and making an impact yeah. and making an impact well, and, long after they're gone. And you never go and drink top shelf things by yourself. No. Those are not the things that you go and just take for granted. No. You know, I have an example. There's a, during the pandemic, um, there's a, there's a bourbon that Disney has that because the NBA played a, well, it's a funny Disney story. We can, pull, we can tie the Disney story in with top shelf creator. LeBron James stayed at one of the Disney hotels because the NBA bubble was at the at Coronado Springs Resort. They played NBA games at the resort. And the bar there had um, this bourbon. So and it, he was complaining because it was like $100 a bottle. So they put it in the gift shop so he could buy it and they could drink it because like, the bars were not all open all the time. And, hello, pandemic. And so they made it possible for him to get it. So when that was happening... You know, a bunch of us went over there like, hey, I wanted to buy some of that so I could save it. It's, you know, it was a special a single barrel that you can only get there. And like when my Disney friends come over, we'll have some suburban together. But I never have it alone. Mm-hmm. Unless unless I'm celebrating a special achievement, which I would much rather do with other people. And, um, yeah, I think that's 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 super interesting about what 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 can what can we celebrate with other people? What can we pour out with other people to celebrate what we create together? And I want, I want my legacy after I'm gone um, to be that I created not just things, but people who, who created better things. Too. Mm-hmm. Well, and the whole point of having a mission is to have other people take part in that. Absolutely. Because you can go so much farther. You can do, you can touch so many more people. Yes. And I'm way more interested in, in in going with other people i rarely do anything that's just my idea it's just it's boring yeah. it's not that interesting to me um, it's much more fun especially because a lot of the things we do require travel or they require connecting with other people and it's much more fun if you can do it with people you like life's mm-hmm. too short everything's to do, more fun with friends life's too short to do work you don't like or people you don't like and mm-hmm. so you know for the first time in history that's really your option so if you could create that life, do it. I'm all in. Let's go. Oh. So tell us a little bit more about the thing and really starting with how it got its name and then the kinds of people that you're wanting to pull into that that are those top shelf kind of people that you want to come on this journey with you so that they can, you can go far. So the thing started, I was doing another conference. It was called Reimagine um, with, an, with, an, with another creator. And things just, things weren't moving forward with us. They were going in a different direction than I was going. They really wanted to turn it into more of a um, a faith-based thing. And I was going a different direction at this point in my life. And so we decided to parting ways. Um, and so I made the decision, like, hey, let's do it. And I, and I, and I struggled with the start of it. Um, I really wish, I wish I would have started on my own. Because you really have to, as much as I like to do things together, there's some things you have to make, make the first step to do. You have to put your stake in the ground. And I wasn't quite willing to do that. So um, I called my, my buddy McNair, who, who you know, and we kind of kicked around the name. And I was like, I, I want to do this event for creators, for leaders, for entrepreneurs, for really creative entrepreneurs um, that want to actually do something. I wanted to create a special event so many of the events that I've been to were just kind of, they were either super practical and not inspiring or they were um, not really, really inspiring. They were like a pep party, but there was no practical information. I wanted to combine the two. And so I, my the kind of by place we started was, a, a, you know, a conference that helped you put it together. You know, most of us went to conferences and felt like we left Ikea. And so we were going to make, you know, we were going to call it the Assemble Conference, but we decided that sounded like a, a bad BBS, um, macaroni and cheese, macaroni crafts and paper plates. 
So um, McNair, I, I said something, you know, kind of how all the brainstorming works. I said, I don't know what to call this thing, <laughs> basically. Um, or something to that effect. And McNair was like, why don't we call it the thing? He's like, that's what people are going to say anyways. <clears throat> so I'm going to Terry's thing. That's what people are going to say. I'm going to go to Terry's thing in Orlando. Um, the thing in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a thing, right? Like, you have a thing, I have a thing. And I was like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. No one will ever, no one will ever go for that. And there's a lot of people who still tell me it's a stupid idea. It breaks all the rules of a niche. <clears throat> but I guarantee everybody listening to this right now as a thing. They're listening, to your, they're listening to Top Shelf Creator Day because they want to create something. They want to make something. And they have a thing. And most of them don't have words to tell people about what they do. Mm -hmm. So here we are, five years later, the thing. The very first year I did it with a business partner that was a complete disaster. He did not share my vision. I was not really clear on my vision. And that's the one thing I would tell people is get, get as clear on your vision as you possibly can or somebody else will come along and try to take it from you. And get really, really, really stubborn on your vision and flexible on the details. I got really stubborn in the beginning about the details and not about the vision. And that created, we barely got through year one. Um, but, you know, this is this is now the, the we've been doing this since 2000. And um, we're doing it in Orlando again. I'm super excited about it. And I'm glad I didn't quit. Because there's definitely been times along the way that I've wanted to quit. Um, it's definitely been an uphill battle. It's the hardest work I do, Cabrina, is getting other people to choose themselves. And the people I care the deepest about helping are the people that struggle the, the most with betting on themselves and picking themselves. In fact, it was my opening talk in the thing LA in 2018. In fact, if you go to discoveryourthing.com, um, you helped me create this awesome quiz. And at the end of that quiz, you'll get a course on discovering your thing. And one of the videos that you'll get is a talk from the thing in 2018 for free and uh, five other talks. So, um, but it's super hard for people to, to pick themselves. And it's a battle that I think every creator faces on a daily basis to, to allow yourself to step into what mm -hmm. you think you deserve. For many of us, other people have told us what we weren't worthy of, and we believe them. And so we have to kind of give a new narrative. And so, yeah, we're really just trying to put together a group of humans um, that have a really clear mission, that want to make the world a better place, and not like in the like a pageant, like answer, world a better place, but really do work that really impacts people and. We're doing our best to make this a place where um, everyone is there really genuinely to um, help and serve the other people in the room and to, to bring more value than they get. And honestly, people people kind of find the back door of the community and exit stage left when they have a different agenda than that. Um, the people that don't stay around, the people that you know will speak one time or will attend one time and never come back are the ones that somehow missed that. And it's, it's, it's been interesting to watch the people that just come every year. Um, even those that come and have spoken in the past that still come and want to attend because they don't want to miss it. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. super exciting. So the 4th, 5th, and 6th in Orlando. I think you have a code. Is it I'm with Cabrina? Is that your code? Yes, yes. And we'll be putting all of this in the show notes but so you can get, wait go the through the quiz, get the talks. Right now, and... they can get on the thing live and get a ticket and hang out with you and sit at your table. Because I think that's what's really, it's one thing to listen to a podcast. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to sit at the, at the table of the person who leads the podcast. And so that's like literally where all of our, all of our codes literally are that person's name and I'm with, except for a couple of weirdos. Um, we've let them do something else, but it's because we want them to realize like you're coming with that person and they're kind of going to help you kind of navigate through the process. And so um, I think it's, I think if you'd ask anybody, including Cabrina, that, it, that that joining this community has been a significant game changer for them. They've made decisions. They've been around people, and they're taking action in ways that they wouldn't have if they'd have never gotten in the room before. 
Yeah. Well, and I think it was so interesting finding this event barely two weeks before it was happening and going, I have to go somewhere or I'm going to lose my mind. I need to be with other humans and going like, okay, cool. I know McNair. We're going to Disney. I know Disney. I don't even care what the conference is about. You pretty much had because I wasn't quite sure. (laughs) Yeah, I had no idea what I was walking into and coming into it and then finding out that it was the exact thing that I needed was an amazing experience and have I've made the best friends of my life that I talk to on a daily basis. Which is crazy to think about. And and, that, and it's not that's not to say that it's a social gathering. Cause it's definitely not just that. Like we definitely get to work, we definitely learn. But we learn together and we try to make the things that we do together fun and that's why Disney plays a that's why it's in Orlando. Because there's something about, um, especially if you get the VV, the VIP or the VVIP ticket, where you spend a day in the parks in the midst of all the like learning. The VIP, VVIP people have two really intense days, and then they get to kind of take a break before the main conference starts, and we kind of have a fun day just playing in the parks, and we're really stepping that experience up even more so this year, and it really helps you kind of think, like we talked about, like to think like Play-Doh, to really kind of go back and to really embrace that childlike sense of wonder. Because I think what a lot of people have lost in life is the ability to just have wonder, for the, just to be in awe. And there are a few places mm-hmm. in the world, like Main Street, USA, when you walk, unless you're just a horrible person and have no sense of like, you can't look at that castle, and, and it's not just the castle, it's what it's what you see around the castle when you see the, some kid seeing it for the first time. And that's what I always tell people. I always take people to the end of Main Street. Now turn around and start watching the look on some kids' faces as they come in this and see this for the first time in the park. And to imagine like what they're thinking. And try to get yourself into that place where wonder and possibility and mm-hmm. try to get lost. I mean, that was what Walt did when he created Walt Disney World was creating a place um, in Disneyland that you would come in and you couldn't see the outside world. That's why Disney World even happened more so because he wanted even more of an experience that where the, you couldn't see the outside world at all when you were in the park. Um, because he wanted you to kind of get lost in frontier land or adventure land and really think you were a pirate for a minute and kind of get lost into that. And so I hope what the thing is really a place where you kind of get lost in the dreams of what your life wants your what your life and your business to be. And then hopefully you have to think, and then I think you can attest this happened that someone would come get some of the tools that they need to make that happen. And then actually get some relationships and some people around them um, that can help make those things a reality. Yeah. The thing that I appreciated about it the most is you come to this thing, you get all of these, this information, and then you get to take all these people with you that become your cheerleaders and your guides and the people that you brainstorm with and come up with new ideas and collaborate with. And it's very different than any other yeah, business I, conference you know, that I've ever been to. You introduced me as your coach, but I, no. I think I'm more of a guide than I am a coach. A coach is someone that stands on the sidelines of your life and yells at you or asks you a bunch of questions and keeps asking you questions in, in, in the modern coaching world. I want to help people and I want to guide them to their destination. You know, when you want to climb Mount Everest, you can't climb Mount Everest without a Sherpa. Someone that's been there that knows the path. Um, and it's not even just about knowing the path that they know other people that have been on the path. And, you know, I want to be someone that helps guide people to the mm-hmm. places they, they want to go, not the places I want to go. I want you to, that's why the Spice Girl question is a question I always ask is, you know, tell me what you want, what you really, really want, because I don't want, I don't want the life that I want for you. I want the life you want for you. And I want the goals that you want to achieve for you. And if I can help leaders do that, if I can help leaders step into the lives that they want, man, now we're having fun. Mm -hmm. And then you're just creating more people to be guides, which I think is such a good thing. And business that I'm in right now is 
I want to create more and more environments where, where the people that I'm creating and working with, that I'm helping them do that part too. And part of that, mm-hmm. you know, you're a systems girl. You know, part of that is, is getting people around you that know how to create systems that allow that to happen. And, you know, that's kind of the phase that I'm in is, is, is a growth and a growth phase that allows more of multiplication and more of like creating people around me that can actually duplicate and replicate some of these processes because I know that I can't do it alone. I know the number of people that I want to help. I can't help. Um, I can't help like Charles Schultz behind a desk next to a hockey team. I need I need I need I need an army of humans that believe in this mission, that believe in each other, and then want to help other people too. So if that yeah. sounds like you. <laughs> so in other words, yes, if you are somebody who wants to really make the next year something spectacular to where you're like, oh my gosh, look at how far I've come, I would highly, highly, highly suggest grabbing a spot joining the community, come and have fun with us. And I will be open for coffee every single morning. So you'll get to hang out with me and all of the people that are, that I look up to so highly. What you'll learn also about me is I'm not a morning person. So you won't find me for coffee in the mornings, but I am, I do, I am an afternoon coffee drinker. I, we are recording this in the afternoon and I've just finished my last night. So, uh, you know, I, and, and I, and that's what's also interesting about this environment is we, I'm trying because of this is my event, I don't start the event at like eight o'clock in the morning because I don't want to go to a conference that starts at eight o'clock in the morning. And I also know that people love meeting for breakfast and like, that's a thing that they do. I love grabbing a granola bar and running out the door rushed. That's (laughs) because that's my life. Um, But (laughs) I, I want to allow, I'm a night owl. Um, You're actually not a morning person either. You're, you're, you're just a FOMO human. (laughs) <laughs> yes. you will find me in the morning you will find me in the afternoon if there's humans i will be there that's sort of what it, 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 it exactly if i was going to call this something else now i might call it entrepreneur camp because i have a huge camping background so I, I tried to create this like it was as fun as camp um the difference that i hope that there is between camp and this is that you walk away feeling like you just don't have like the sense of inspiration, but actually have um, kind of that like Boy Scout, Girl Scout field guide to actually help you through the process. What some of the projects that Sabrina and I are working together and work, uh, other people in our community are working together is I've realized mm-hmm. that like, there's a group of things and specific skills that not everybody has, but they need. And so I'm, I'm realizing that um, if I can't find the people that can teach that, I'm going to have to raise up people that can. And I want to shine a light on the brilliance of around me, and and I want I want to see people, you know, Cabrini, you've had, you know, you you've you've accomplished a ton in this year, but you faced some major setbacks. You know, you're basically nuking your business because it wasn't serving you. And you know, you may not have hit all the revenue mm-hmm. goals that you wanted to hit, but you're you're curating your life where your life at the end of this is going to be better than it was at the beginning. And it's going to take a lot. You're, you're you're doing the really hard work, so that, you know, maybe by next year we're talking about a mm-hmm. much different. We're not just talking about meeting revenue goals. We're actually talking about meeting um, all of the goals that you want to meet. That you're in a spot where you're thriving, and your business is, and your life is thriving, and and you're you're actually getting to do the things that you've always wanted to do. Um, you know, one of the things I quickly discovered even just meeting you in the hotel lobby for the first time in person. I'm like, this girl's smart. This girl is showing up in a lot of places where people aren't appreciating her genius. Um, and that was something I told her in the, in the first minutes of meeting her that like, you're, you're around, you're around people that aren't necessarily seeing your greatness and you have a lot to bring to this world. And if you're going to, if you're willing to step into it, um, and, you know, you were part of the VVIP day last year. And it was interesting to watch that process in your own life because I, I still remember, I remember vividly your 45 minutes that day. Because um, you kept talking about this person that you were and how everybody wanted you to be this and your business to be this. And you really wanted something mm-hmm. different. 
and it's taken you 10 months to go through that process and to allow yourself to actually have that. Yeah. And, you know, you're having to make some hard decisions around that and, you know, maybe take a step back so you can take 10 steps forward. And those are, those are bold moves that would have been impossible for you to make alone. And so the community has been here to kind of catch you, you know, because we're talking camp, you know, in, in like a trust fall. They've been here to yeah. catch you when you've been trying to like reposition and re, um, you know, I, I, I love when my GPS tells me it's recalculating. <laughs> it's like, you didn't listen to my instructions, so we're going to have to give you a new set of instructions. Uh, I do that with Waze all the time. It's like we're driving out. It's like, I am not turning on that street. I've been <laughs> down that street. That's not a street I'm turning down. <laughs> um, and so, you know, like you've definitely, in, 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 in like, like many people, <laughs> If I would have asked you the goal that you would have come to the thing last year, you have a new goal now. You have a new destination. And that's part of growth is, you know, if had we mapped to get to that old goal, you'd be unhappy right now. Okay. And um, you have to learn how to gauge the actual success by mm -hmm. where you're actually trying to go. And you're making the brave decisions to actually move your life in a way actually arrive at the destination that you desire not like mm -hmm. somebody else told you you should be asking for this thing. yeah well and i think it's having the people in this last year who have been able to see the greatness and the bigger things that i want to do by those tiny little sentences that i say that you know somebody's face lights up and you're like that's that's the thing how do we get to that thing and being able to realize that it's not all just about the money. It's not just about, okay, well, I made the 10K month. I made the 20K month. I did that. Absolutely. And it was miserable. And being able to have different things that you're gauging it off of as well. The money is important and we need to get there. But having the basis of this is the business and the life and the I vision that I want for myself so that I don't wake up one day and go... How the hell did I get here? Which last time I checked, you could make more than that working at McDonald's. And they had worked a whole lot less. And, you know, when, when the ice cream machine breaks at McDonald's, no one's calling anybody at home. It just doesn't work. If you've ever tried to go get an ice cream cone at McDonald's, the ice cream machine never works. Because they're not calling that person at home. They're not worrying about it. But if you're an entrepreneur, you're always working. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they work tons and tons of hours and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads that some guru told them they needed to, they needed to be running to build a life they hated. And um, I want you to build a life that you love. And that's what, that's what I think you're doing with this mission of the Top Shelf Creator. Uh, and he's been in the process of kind of helping you come up with this and being around the, you know, the creative stages and helping you just get all this lined up and dialed in. It's about, you know, you want to live a, a life that allows you to make the decisions that you want to make and to make the, you know, to step into the things that you want to step into. And oddly, th those are those are odd things for people to do in 2022. That's not the norm. Most normal people are just following the path of the person in front of them. And, you know, one of the big ideas I explore in my book, Making mm -hmm. Elephants Fly, which you can get on terrydeagle.com, um, is this idea of, you know, the very first thing that we, we teach a child in kindergarten is just how to stand in line, how to follow the child in front of them. It's what they do to elephants when they're in captivity. They make sure they know how to tail. And what tailing is, is that you just, you, the trunk of the elephant behind grabs the tail of the elephant in front of them. And that's what we do in life. We stand in line and stare at the, um, excuse my language, the ass of the elephant in front of us. And we keep marching forward and, and to go lead your own life. I was never that kid that enjoyed like marching in line. I've always been the kid that, that, that ever since I was in kindergarten, I wanted to hop out of line. You know, I was so bad. I was so good at sec at second grade. They let me do it twice. Um, and because that was the, that was the phase in life where I started to say, I want out of line. I want out of this, this system. I don't learn this way. And I want to, to chase something different and I don't want to follow what everybody else is doing. And, you know, I would, I would, I would challenge you if you're listening today to, to start getting out of line and to start making a ruckus and 
cause a scene and do that thing that you've always dreamed of doing. And those are the, to really answer your question, those are the kind of people I want to see in Orlando at the event. Those are the people who are listening to this a month, maybe a couple of days before the event. I want you to get online, go to the thing.live, use the code I'm with Cabrino, buy a ticket, and pick yourself. Say, I'm going to get around other people who think, act, and believe the way that I believe and who are willing to get out of line, who are ready to cause a ruckus, who are ready to do something different. And I want to get around the knowledge that allows me to do that. So if that's you, I hope to see you in Orlando. You'll never be able to get rid of us. <laughs> yeah, we would love to see you there because it'll be a community that you'll never forget and will walk with you for the rest of your life. Does not follow instructions. <laughs> exactly. So as we wrap up today, I have one more question as for I just you said. <laughs> that we ask everybody at the Am end I of the podcast guy? is um, if humans came with a warning label, the key to what would yours say? Um, in 2022 is you have to be really careful for who you let speak into. Yes. And I think a lot of us are taking advice from people who have <laughs> people who are only giving us advice based on their, their, their agenda is sure you're going to need to find someone that you can take instructions from someone that you believe in but as far as the genuine societal rules like i don't follow those rules i don't like being told what to do um, i like being told what's possible and i'm here to tell you what's possible is, is if you're willing to to pick yourself mm -hmm. bet on yourself choose yourself and not conform that uh things will be different. So uh, does not conform. Does not follow instructions. That's definitely number one. That's a good time. And uh, I appreciate Cabrina and her her literally being an example mm -hmm. for you guys today of someone that's picked themselves. Um, at, at, at even maybe a high cost. Love it. Is there any last things that you'd like to say before we sign the off today? choice to do the thing that you've been designed to do is not an easy choice. It's one that may cost you some things. It may actually cost you everything. So my challenge to you is to find something that you believe in that much and go and get it and go and do it. And don't let anyone tell you that it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and there's been so many great things that you've said today, Terry, that I've got notes galore for people to go back and listen to. Thanks for having me. And I just am so grateful for falling into the thing and finding you people and being able to really get to know what possibilities are out there with people that have big visions. So thank you for coming on the podcast today. Okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And again, you can find Terry at The Thing Live and come join us and come sit at the table with us and really get those ideas out into the world and figure out what your thing is. So until next week, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Top Shelf Creator Podcast. You can find us on Instagram and TikTok at Top Shelf Creator. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we would love to see you share it with a friend and give us a review wherever you listen to help us reach more creators just like you.